Paul, and especially thank you all for um, coming on the last day and hearing me ramble about a topic that I find particularly interesting and hopefully something that you are a little bit more interested about after this. Um, so, uh, my name is Mark Roser. I am a fourth year neurology resident at the Medical University of South Carolina in Balmy, Charleston. Whenever you want to come down, you're always welcome. And I'll be, um, I'll be speaking about spaceflight and its potential effects on intracranial pressure. So, the first thing I want to talk about is vision changes. So, vision changes was really one of the main things that made people start questioning okay, what's going on with the brain and what's going on with the eyes in space? In 2005, astronauts were noted to have worsened vision. This is both seen on the NASA side as well as Roscosmos. There was a publication actually a couple of months prior to that that showed that uh, cosmonauts were actually having um, some swelling in the back of the eye, and they didn't really know why. When the NASA astronauts started to have these, vis these vision changes, when they came back to Earth, they underwent lumbar punctures, and the lumbar punctures was due to multiple reasons. One, to look at the chemical composition of the fluid itself, but also to look at the actual pressure. And they saw that you were getting uh, intracranial pressures of 18 to 28.5. 18 is normal, um, and 20 is, is getting there, but when you get above 25, then you actually start looking at increased pressure. And there are conditions, which I'll be mentioning uh, very briefly, that are seen um, in that 25 kind of plus range. These, pressure, these changes in pressure, like I said in 25, suspect to be similar to idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is a lot of times considered to be the terrestrial analog to what we see in space like with uh, potential changes with vision. And like I mentioned before, Roscosmos did report eight of their rear cosmonauts, which was a, a little less than half, um, to have uh, this optic disc edema. And this ranged from mild to moderate via percentage as far as the actual change in the amount of edema that they had. These vision changes became a little bit more well-developed and researched and actually became an entity known as Spaceflight Associated Neurocular Syndrome, or SANS. It's composed of kind of four cardinal features consisting of chorioretinal folds, which are kind of these lumpy, bumpy uh, layers at the back of the eye. You can get that swelling, like I was mentioning before. You can actually get deformation of the eye itself. If you think back to like a pinhole camera, if you start changing the dimensions of the box, it's gonna make the image <coughs> blurry or not. And that's what happens is we see the, the globe of the eye um, actually get distorted. And that ultimately results in the thing that we really care about, which is this vision change. There's a couple of means or a couple of ways in which we are able to assess it. One is just good all looking at the back of the eye. There's a couple of different ways as technology has advanced that we've been able to utilize more on that from cameras um, to you know, fundoscopes. Um, and, it's, and we're trying to make it easier and easier. Another thing called optical coherent tomography, if you can think about it, it's kind of like an x-ray that's able to do a cross section of the back of the eye. And based off of that, you're able to see the actual layers of the eye. And then ultrasound, so intraocular ultrasound, you can see um, if there's increased pressures or not. As you can see on the right, it's a just quick breakdown of some of the initial findings where we saw in SANS, the optic disc edema was clearly the most prominent, and the other, and the other uh, signs weren't as obvious, uh, but they were definitely certainly there. So going back to the ultrasound, like I mentioned before, so utilizing this ultrasound, we're able to see not only the eye, but we're actually able to see the nerves behind the eye, and more importantly, something called the optic nerve sheath. So it's this uh, protective casing that, uh, that um, envelops the nerve, and when we see increased pressure, we actually see, um, as you can see in that picture on the right, you'll see a ballooning out. So while you're not necessarily knowing for sure what's going on with the pressure, we see these indications or almost smoke that there might be some kind of smoldering fire. Another thing that recently was published was actually looking at the length of the eye itself, and we did appreciate that the longer you are on Earth, that uh, duration actually gets shorter and shorter. So we know that there is more optic disc edema just from an actual length perspective. And as you can see here, um, it still doesn't necessarily entirely go away, even if you're back on Earth for up to a year. And we're still collecting data very actively, but we do know that there could be a potential degree of non-reversibility in this. So now we're going to the meat and potatoes, the pressure itself. There's a lot, but I'm going to kind of simplify it. Um, 
the brain loves blood. It obviously loves nutrition, and it's going to give you a lot of uh, kind of good feedback. One of the main reasons how it does that is uh, carbon dioxide. Everybody thinks, oh, your body runs on oxygen, but your brain is kind of counterintuitive. It's the opposite. When it senses too much carbon dioxide, it wants more blood. And that's what this uh, cerebral uh, perfusion pressure is part of. You have this autoregulation component where if you have low uh, oxygen or high CO2, it's going to want to gobble more up. So you're going to see that kind of come in. That's what the PaO2 and the PCO2 is on the right side. And that's going to increase cerebral blood flow. When someone has had a really catastrophic uh, brain injury and we don't want more fluid coming in, we put them into a coma, we kind of calm the brain down, and we also kind of turn down the, uh, we tur I'm sorry, we turn down the CO2 to not uh, want more perfusion. And that ultimately leads with increased cerebral blood volume. The more blood that's in, the more that's going to stay there. That blood is, as anybody traveling here, if you didn't get up in the plane, you know that your legs get more swollen if you're not moving around. And that's what happens. If you have more stasis of blood, there's a higher likelihood that that fluid's gonna start leaking out. And that leaking out can either result in increased CSF or it can cause problems with the actual obstruction with uh, the veins. That's ultimately gonna lead to increased cerebral volume. And then lastly, increased pressure. Now, why is that? And that's why, because we have something called the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, all right? Basically what that is, is something that is in a hard, hard case, pressure's gotta go somewhere, okay? And the problem is that if you get a mosquito bite, your arm can swell, and it's fine. But if you have an injury, or if you have some other kind of problem with, with pressure, we don't have that option. We really only have two places where pressure can escape, behind the eyes, and more critically, the brain stem. And so when we have these sudden influxes of increased pressure, like if someone has a really bad intracranial bleed, that can ultimately lead to what we call herniation, or when the brain will actually start compressing on the brain stem. And that's obviously a neurological emergency. The normal brain is broken down with a couple of components. We have the veins, we have that oxygen-rich arterial blood, we have the actual pink brain tissue itself, and then the CSF. IIH, which was that phenomenon that I was telling you about, this increased intracranial pressure, this increased uh, idiopathic hypertension, it causes headaches. And the reason why it causes headaches is because you're getting increased venous obstruction, so you can't get the blood out. That's gonna lead to increased arterial flow as well, and that's ultimately gonna compress the brain a little bit, and it's gonna increase the CSF. So all of those, uh, the vein and the arterial and the CSF is gonna ultimately compress in the brain, it doesn't like it, that's why they have headaches, and that's why they have vision changes. SANS on the other hand, so SANS, we do see, um, and I'll get to it in a couple of slides, an increased venous component. Um, the arterial side, we don't notice it as much as we do with IAH, and we don't get headaches, oddly enough, in SANS. You would think if it's so similar to IAH that we would, but it's, it's clearly demonstrated that it's not exactly the same. But more importantly, with, with um, a lot of neuroradiologic imaging, we do know that over time, there is an increase in the ventricle size, so there is more CSF, there is more of that fluid hanging out in the skull. But again, that's counterintuitive. Why are we seeing increased vein, not too much of an increase in arterial, a massive increase in CSF, but we're not getting that really obvious cardinal features of headaches. And that's why we think that that might be more associated with SANS than previously thought. Getting back to the venous side of things, uh, Serena Unknown Chancellor was uh, a member of a study where they basically took astronauts, 16 of them, and they gave them ultrasounds. And they wanted to look at the actual velocity of blood in their jugular, um, in your jugular vein. And what we saw was there was actually not only a stasis, but actually a retrograde blood flow in the veins. Um, so the blood that was going into the brain, it wasn't necessarily coming out, and we didn't really know why that was happening. That was obviously concerning because during the same study, they actually found that someone had developed a pulse up to them as a special payload in order to break it down. And so there's obviously some heavy, heavy clinical implications outside of just the SANS component. In October of last year, uh, my group published um, some findings where we took venograms, which is this imaging modality, it's an MRI venography, um, this imaging modality that really lights up the veins. And as we can see on the left, we had uh, astronauts that either had the cardinal uh, features or symptoms of SANS, um, and then we had ones that didn't. And the ones that did, you can see on the left, the astronaut with SANS pre-flight, and then you can look at it to the right, you can see there's a substantial enlargement. Now, 
keep in mind, this is, a, this is probably the most obvious of the pictures because I'm certainly not a neuroradiologist, um, but even I can see that, and, and I'm a little blind as well. Um, but more importantly, on the right side, you don't see that change. So there is something there that the people that have the propensity of developing SANS might have some problem with the veins, they might have something else that we haven't quite determined yet, but more importantly, the people that don't develop SANS have some kind of neuroprotective component, and maybe that's why they're not developing those symptoms. So going back to the carbon dioxide, like I mentioned, we know that when you get a bunch of people, especially now that we're having more and more and more people going to the International Space Station, we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out CO2. Now, unfortunately, there's only limited amounts of CO2 scrubbers, and this is something for any of you that read Scott Kelly's book, this is something that he really, really, really complained about. He mentioned that uh, you know, his uh, significant other time, she knew when there was increased people on board because he'd be cranky. He'd be complaining of a headache, and so you, should, you know, they kind of put it together, oh, it's just because you're not breathing as much oxygen as you. The carbon dioxide levels on the ISS are increased and it does fluctuate. When we had the nine people on board not too long ago, there was an unprecedented spike in CO2 just because of the sheer nature that you had more people. And you see when people are exercising as well, um, they try and balance out when to exercise and when not to because they don't want to go outside those parameters for CO2 so that people don't start having the, the mood problems or the headaches. The problem is, as I had mentioned before, we know that CO2 is really important for the regulation of blood flow in and out of the brain. So, are we getting these increased pressure spikes when someone's exercising? Is it because they're actually exercising themselves, or is it because they're breathing? The last thing to mention is, gas does not quite operate the same in space as it does on Earth. You'll actually get this phenomenon where you'll actually get bubbles around your face. And so these people, that just by a transient nature of being in the ISS, they're gonna have increased CO2 levels from having this gas bubble that's kind of just hanging around because it doesn't distribute equally. Of course, though, NASA is like severely, severely and heavily considering this. That's why they're revising the carbon scrubbers. They're trying to think, okay, how can we increase the efficiency of them? Should we redesign them? Should we add more? And they're continuing to try to uh, of assess this. The graph on the left, it just kind of demonstrates that with more CO2, uh, we know that cerebral blood flow increases, as I mentioned. Now getting back actually to measurements itself, this is challenging. We've never actually measured intracranial pressure in space for multiple reasons. One, it's very challenging logistically um, to actually perform a lumbar puncture. Um, two, there is some inherent risk with it. Um, you know, it's a little bit more of an invasive test, so it does require special tools and special skills. Um, and so because of that, we've performed other tests that is our next best option. The two mainly are, um, the top graph actually demonstrates when we took a chip. So we actually had a, a chimpanzee that underwent ICP monitoring. And what you can see is on the right side, there's the wave cores. And the key, the key thing that I want you to look at is there's kind of three big points of it. There's the initial increase, if you look on the top left, there's that increase in that, that, that spike, then it comes down, there's a little bump, and then it goes back down. That's normal. But what you see when they went up into space, which is on the right side, it was much more erratic. It was all over the place. It was much more dramatic as well. So we know that there's probably increased fluctuations in ICP, but again, this is only in an animal model. The other thing that we did was something called the, uh, the Omaya Reservoir Studies. So Omaya Reservoir, what it is, it's a port that's basically been planted inside the skull as a means for fast delivery of chemotherapy for patients that had brain cancer. They took people that recovered from their brain cancer who still had the Omaya reservoirs in place, they put them on parabolic flight, and they actually removed a little bit of fluid while they were in parabolic flight because it's not quite as logistically challenging as doing a lumbar puncture. What they noticed uh, was something similar to it as well, where you do get um, a degree of variability with ICP, but it wasn't as, quite, it wasn't as obvious as it was for the, the animal model. I will say though, there are some caveats, of course, one, these people did have pathology. So that's going to change just the natural um, kind of order of how the brain operates when it comes to blood flow because it has been, um, has been introduced to, to substantial degrees of, of uh, stress. And the other thing is, is that there's also a foreign body that's also been placed. So you have to kind of think, all right, is that providing some kind of outlet for that pressure? Because remember, as I mentioned before, when you only have behind the eyes and the brainstem, by you, you drilling a hole to have this catheter, you've now introduced a potential exit valve. 
With the Omaya Reservoir study, we did see that even complete removal of gravity doesn't pathologically elevate the ICP. But as we had seen before, well, when they come back to Earth, they do have potentially pathologically elevated ICPs. So what's happening between that, that you know, being up there and returning down, but also more importantly, it being a parabolic flight, it's very, very, very short. We're not looking at the two weeks that's required in order for people to first develop the signs or symptoms of SANS. So it's not exactly perfect, but it's the best thing we've got. That leads me to my next um, kind of step. And the thing that I'm the most optimistic about is Polaris Dawn. So Polaris Dawn, uh, Kid Petit, he's actually going to, he volunteered himself to have an intrafecal monitor implanted for the whole duration of the flight. So what he's having is he's gonna have a little uh, transducer inserted into his lower back, and it's just gonna be doing nonstop assessments on the pressure. And so we're gonna see what the pressure is like while it's going up, while it's up there, and while it's coming down, which is really, really exciting. Of course, he's not gonna be there for those two weeks, which is what a lot of us would really love to see, but what's happening from you know, day zero to day 13 that people don't develop SANS or, you know, the signs or the symptoms, and then suddenly they do. But this is going to provide a lot of insight. We're also looking at um, advancing imaging modalities. My group in Charleston, we did the first MRI in motion. We have a portable MRI scanner that we threw into the back of an ambulance, and we actually took pictures going 55 miles an hour. The hope is to further kind of mobilize it, put an aircraft, and eventually get it to, uh, you know, suborbital flight or beyond. But I think the biggest thing is, is that we're going to just have to do more and more and more research. We need to integrate more imaging modalities, you know, the optical hair sonography, ultrasound, all those are great, and there's innovations constantly uh, being out. Um, so I think that's, that's uh, the next frontier, and I really do think this is a very active and critical area of research because especially when we move further and further out, the degree of vision getting worse, the degree of other implications with abnormal blood flow, and even the symptoms that we might see with cognition <laughs> might be all really tied into how the intracranial pressure is being um, ad adapted or changed in spaceflight. Uh, and that's why it's really, really important that we all kind of put our heads together and try and figure this out from multiple angles. Thank you. because that would really open up the whole thing for, um, for, for research. Yes, yes sir, absolutely. So uh, yes, there is, it's a very, very, very hot, active um, area of research. So trying to look at, I think probably the main leader right now is ultrasound and trying to utilize different ultrasound um, depths, modalities, um, and sequences to try and help illustrate CSF flow better. But I think ultimately, really the, it, getting back to the foundations, flying somebody up there who's a physician or someone who's extremely well trained and comfortable doing a lumbar puncture, trying to do just pure surgical technique and, and just getting it done will be the most demonstrative of what we're seeing. Thanks.